Oh, and we're live. Hey there, it's Friday again. It's about 11-ish. We always are precisely on the 11-ish dot for you on every Friday at the Friday Hangout. And this is the show where we talk about digital marketing, advertising, social media, all those sorts of things. Uh, and we talk to incredibly interesting thought leaders and folks that we respect uh, and know. And this week we have somebody that is not outside of that realm and his name is Brian Kramer. How you doing, Brian? Good. How are you doing? All right. All right. And just before we get to you, I want to just make sure that folks know we've got the usual suspects here. We've got Janet Fouts. How you doing, Janet? Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Oh, I'm not hearing. Say it again. Is that a... Uh, we got we got Google Hangouts lagging today. And then Steve. How you doing, Steve? Doing great. Doing all right. Contrary to what he said before the hangout. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and so just as a reminder, folks, you can find us every single Friday around 11-ish on our Google Hangout that we stream live at thefridayhangout.com. And me uh, on the Steveology can, blog. And and you, are you you putting it on your blog now? No, just you can find me on Steveology blog. Oh, and I was just saying we could just put the, we, the, the show itself. Uh, and uh, and then you can also uh, find the past episodes or the recordings after we record them at 11 on Fridays. Uh, you can do the audio on iTunes, the video on uh, YouTube, the audio also on Spreaker.com as well as I on iHeartRadio. Uh, so without further ado, uh, today's topic is active listening and social selling. What? And uh, yeah, see, Steve, what? What did he do? And, and, uh, and the marketer says, what? What? Uh, <laughs> and what we're going to do is uh, we, we want to riff a little bit off of this um, post that Brian Kramer posted over at briankramer.com, B-R-Y-A-N-K-R-A-M-E-R.com. Uh, and the name of the post is 2014 Predictions for the Year of Relentless Curiosity. Uh, and, you know, the active listening and social selling is really only one small piece of this entire uh, post here. There's a lot of interesting things that I think folks should check out. But um, Brian is, is, is calling out a prediction that active listening will meet social selling. And Brian, real quick, just before we dive into that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself so that folks who haven't met you can uh, virtually meet you through the show here. Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, anybody with the uh, the Twitter handle of sushi, anything with sushi in it gets my attention. So I think I follow food um, wherever it goes. So <laughs> uh, thank you for um, thanks for having me again. I um, yeah. So I lead kind of two different lives. One is uh, as president CEO of Pure Matter, which is a digital agency. Uh, we are a um, an agency that focuses on storytelling and content development. Uh, we work mainly with enterprise clients, and um, and we're we're excited uh, to be in our thirteenth year of business here in uh, San Jose, California, um, right around the corner from I think all three of you guys. So we're all talking locally here, probably within maybe a hundred miles of each other. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, yeah, and then my other life is just uh, getting out there. I, I speak a lot. I'm um, in the in the process of writing a book. I'm uh, write I write a lot. I blog a lot. Um, I I guest appear on certain uh, uh, things like this, and just enjoy getting out and evangelizing the company and what we're what we're talking about. So, um, and then just connecting and making friends and using social media like we're using it here. So, um, one of the things that I'm really excited about, obviously, is social listening. And you guys picked right up on that, and that was that's been, you know, uh, something I've been speaking about now for the last year and a half, and I think it's really important. It's just kind of flipped over into uh, becoming uh, this this land of social selling, and what does that mean, and how does active listening uh, help you in social selling? So so um, that's kind of where I've been focusing as well. I'd almost challenge to say that folks think that they are already have been doing listening for quite some time, and and w uh, just what's the difference first of all between the putting the word active in front of it? What would be active listening versus what probably people think that they're already doing in social media or have been for the couple last couple of years? Yeah, that's a good a good question. Um, a lot of people think that they're listening by following a hashtag, and that's not the case. 
um, by following a person, that's not the case. By actually looking people like my friend, uh, friend I think mutual friends of probably some of ours, mutual uh, Ted Rubin says, looking people in the in the eye digitally. So when you actually see what's behind a person, you're looking at their persona and you're understanding where they're at, what they're participating in, what they're talking about, and how do you use some of that information to either build upon your marketing message, to build your, um, your, your target market, to actually activate a conversation. Um, I'm always more interested in talking with someone when they take the time to actually uh, look look me up and figure out who I am and talk to me on the level that I'm I, that I talk about. Um, if they talk to me about Wheaties, I probably wouldn't know what to say. But if they talk to me about social media, I'd have a lot easier time talking back with them. So, you know, really really understanding what a person's all about and talking with them on their level is really more key in active active listening. Take us take us down to kind of a real world example. You you share one in your predictions about uh, your iPod. Yeah, uh, that was an awesome um, thing that happened to me because I got it back. <laughs> that wouldn't be such a great story if I didn't get it back, but um, but I did. And my my um, my iPad was lost in a um, in the uh, car company that that I left it in, which was Hertz, and Hertz. Um, I, le I just left it in the trunk of the car. So the next day, I realized I left it, and I tweeted. I didn't know where to go. I mean, their site was a little big for me to understand, and so I just tweeted Hertz. And Hertz tweeted back and said, follow us, and, um, and, and, DM, and we'll DM you, uh, and we did. And then within basically one tweet, I gave them my, I DM my, my information. They, they, they t DM me back and said, we've located your iPad, set, uh, DM us your address, and we'll send it back to you. Wow. So within two days, I had my iPad back. And they used social media through active listening. They found me probably through, <laughs> I would imagine a lot of people in this country, if not the world, who are complaining because they lost their stuff there, and got my stuff back to me. And, you know, I really call that, customer you can call it customer care but I, I really think it's marketing because here I am talking about it um, and at the same time I got I got my stuff back and I'm brand loyal I'm gonna go back to that company because I know they're they're gonna take care of me so that that really left a mark on me I think that is where social business is heading where social active listening is heading um, connecting your customer care customer support whatever you want to call it with you know kind of how we how we connect with brands so it sounds like it's really very much about having somebody at the helm to be proactive in, 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 in searching out folks that have issues or problems. It may not even be that they are related to their particular brand, for instance, um, but, but they're, they're, they're sitting there at the helm w looking for problems to solve or looking for people to connect with uh, instead of sort of waiting for notification uh, on one of their devices. Yeah, you know, that's, um, that's right. Active listening is being proactive. And that's um, that seeing what what happens before somebody really gets, uh, um, you know, upset. And and when you when you have to go to a second tweet and and no one's listening, it really becomes um, a challenge of just thinking that brand really doesn't care. You know, I put out the thought of uh, I took the time to tweet somebody, whether it even is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I really think answering. Um, you know some of the some of the good stuff, some of the quality good stuff that's out there is in a brand's best uh, case. Yeah, wouldn't you say timing is also of a, is of the essence, right? So when uh, if this had been hours and hours, or even potentially days, which slip by very quickly later, it could be the difference between you being aggravated, spoiling your day. Uh, feeling like they're really actively um, engaging with you or being sort of more uh, reactive than yeah. than proactive, right? Um, would you would you agree? And and I mean, if if I'm trying to think of some cases, for instance, at the Rio, you know, you and I met at New Media Expo not, uh, only a week or two ago, and I, I was over there trying to figure out where I could, I think, put some of my stuff or something as I was checking out. And uh, I don't remember if that was the question, but I reached out to them on their Twitter handle and had somebody from the conference respond to me, and then a day later or, or hours and hours and hours later had the, had the Rio respond to me. Um, and so it just uh, felt like, had they been a little bit more responsive, I probably would have been uh, a bit impressed, but... 
Yeah, so that's that's a really good um, point, I, and I and I I, I just um, can't stress it enough as well. Timeliness is everything. If you don't answer back in a timely manner, I think you're screwed. And 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 that's just the bottom line. So you know when you look at um, you know Marriott Hotel is a great case study. When Marriott, I think it was six months ago, had a placard on there. Uh, their um, concierge desk with free coffee and um, so actually I don't know exactly the time but whenever uh, um, whenever September 11th was right so you can do the math there and when they put the placard out it said um, we in honor of 9-11 we would like to give away free coffee between the hours of 9-15 and 10 o'clock so they're giving away free coffee for 45 minutes and somebody tweeted it out saying you know that they were using it in their um, own uh, for their own self-promotion it, it wasn't authentic it wasn't good and it got tweeted out so that placard got tweeted over I think 5,000 times or retweeted 5,000 times and um, and then it also got favorited uh, I think just about the same so so it got t it, it took off and here's the thing when that took off, it lasted for three days. Nobody responded for Marriott. They didn't have uh -huh. any response whatsoever. And that killed them because had they responded day one, almost within the hour, and I'll tell you why I know this to be a fact, is because when they did answer on day three, it was a very heartfelt, uh, great response. And the minute they responded, all tweets stopped. So if we just respond sometimes, of course with the right thing, but if we respond in an authentic way, as cliche as that sounds, it's, gonna, it's going to mitigate the crisis that could happen for the next two days, three weeks, six months. Yeah, timeliness is everything. Yeah, and it, it's been fun to watch. Lately, there have been a lot of people playing with that kind of lag time. Uh, I posted it in the chat, but there's this really great story of a guy who had an ongoing relationship with the Applebee's account on Facebook and basically he started talking to them in, on their Facebook page and they started responding to, to him in a very personal and, and fun kind of way and they had a whole bunch of fun with it and it's really made a lot of stories. It was an ad week so you know it's getting lots of lots of press but there's also been a lot of stories where you know people have been playing with accounts that were actually bots where they would respond to them in, you know, with really stupid questions and start these whole ongoing conversations. So really, if brands allow that to happen right now, they are really toast. Janet, did you have a question? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yes. So, what kind of what kind of advice do you give for brands that allows them to really develop those kind of active listening programs beyond hire somebody who really knows what they're doing and sits on the account all day, which isn't always easy for a brand to do? What kind of things can they set up to make this easier for them? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's another one, uh, a good one. Um, I I I kind of have my own kind of process. I'm sure we all we all have you know, a way of approaching this um, in different steps. I've kind of developed my own six-step process that, um, that helps to establish, you know, how to approach good, quality, active social listening. Um, and so I can run through that if you want. Um, yeah, the, fir the first one's identify your audience. I mean, that, that's kind of a no-brainer, but you got to know who, who, what, where, and when you want to you want to listen to. So, um, you know, using pieces of software I think is is a must now at this point. Um, when you're trying to identify your audience, you have to use the software to help you identify that because sometimes you don't know where the where the needle exists um, in the haystack, and and uh, and that's where software really comes in I think to help you that's not to say that you can't scour the Twitter screen for the billion and a half tweets that come through every day that's gonna um, you know give you at least one or two things good things but to get really the good a good picture I think at this point big data really is is calling for um, a piece of software to help you identify your audience um, and so that's that's number one number two is really creating a listening strategy um, you know, you, you have to know which social networks you want to listen to out of that target audience and where you want to be creating lists of keywords, 
um, how that how that's starting to shape up. You have to test it. You have to let it run for a good month before you're going to get any results back, so that you can all, you can start to uh, make one degree shifts along the way and 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 make sure that your um, uh, listening strategy is, is kept on on um, on track. Um, and like I said before, choosing your technology then kind of you know continues forward as as kind of a a number three if you wanted to put it to that where you know you can set up your Google alerts, your social mentions, and and maybe your Radian Six or your Mutual Mind or whatever it is to get your social listening strategy starting to hum. And I always like to put it out on different networks in terms of you know different I'm sorry different uh, technologies to see what they come back with because there really isn't one solution yet that's kind of the end all be all. So running it on several is really important. Um, the fourth one's appoint a, a savvy mo uh, social media expert to be your designated listener. Um, uh, and depending upon how big the company is, uh, that could obviously be several. Um, but getting that person really understanding what they're listening to, why they're listening to it, and then reporting it back to the right people. So this is where customer care and social selling start to, um, start to differentiate or start to become uh, more integrated. And then number five is creating a response strategy. So like we just talked about with the Marriott example, having that response ready to go in a crisis situation. If they say this, then we will say this. Having those kind of key platform uh, uh, response responses set is really going to help. And then number, number six is really just be accountable. Um, be sure the executives know what's happening on social media. Make sure that you're reporting all this information back to the company and letting them know what kinds of um, advice on, on how the company may need to adapt in the future. That's what this is all about. It's about helping using this information to help the company navigate their, their product, their service, their solution, whatever it is, so that you can continue to stay on track with what the consumer is, is advising. I mean, that's why we're doing all this listening. We want to know what the customer thinks so that we can take that interesting idea, crowdsource it, and start to push our companies into the right direction using them to help guide us. Yeah, so, I think so one of the things... I'm sorry, sorry go ahead. I was going to say, one of, I think you, what you said is in terms of taking the information back, a, a lot of uh, data people are giving, their, you know, they're giving, creating these reports with these like graphs and these numbers and they're giving to management once a month or whatever they're doing. And one of the really sad things about that is that missed opportunity you're talking about is they're not contextualizing that information, they're not talking about, you know, why that's important, what's happened, what's moved the numbers, and, and helping people understand how to make sure that data actual. They're just giving them reports. And, and so the more they do with that is, the, you know, I, the better. So I just, I think that's a great point, Brian. You, you know, and I wonder because I, I think one of the things that probably um, hits folks immediately as they think of this, um, knowing folks' aversion sometimes to being more active on social and what that means for the time they have to dedicate to it and that sort of thing, is this feels a lot like it's a potential one-to-one -one versus one-to-many where where it doesn't feel like it could scale or that the impact even of having that one-to-one, -one, for instance, returning a uh, um, an iPad to you um, is great for retaining you and, and making you feel good. And I think if, if anybody thinks a little farther than that, they realize they've got an advocate that likely has, an, uh, has the potential to spread that joy for that brand uh, and become a, an active advocate for it. Um, it is this something that you feel, Brian, when it comes to being actively listening? I mean, when you're actively listening, you're looking for sort of individual people with individual problems to solve or individual things that you can address and interact with them. Um, do you think that that's something that folks – what do you say to folks that, 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 that think that that's something – uh, that doesn't scale well with the resources that they have. Is it is it, what's the ROI on that for them? Sorry, the the Google is um, just breaking up a little bit, so I'm trying to understand the the question. I think you were saying um, how does how does active listening scale for any kind of company? Yeah, sure. No problem. Even if it's clear, people have a hard time getting with the questions I'm having. So it's all good, Brian. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, essentially, people. It sounds like a one to one thing. How how, um, how should people look at it when it comes to how how that scales? So you can't. I, I just want to be clear that you can't scale relationships. Um, you can, but you can scale listening. 
because listening is um, you know as big as you really want to want to take it. I mean, it, it, you, again, using a piece of software that helps you to listen is the easy part. Setting it up right, understanding who your audience is, making sure that you're weeding out the crap getting all the good stuff in there and then actually tagging it and going through and doing the manual labor of sorting it all out that's the hard part I think that's what you're getting at is how do you how do you scale that part and that part is really um, you know uh, like I said before that's like number five that's that that savvy social listener that's the assignment of somebody who is um, you know sometimes in a, in a small company that could be your community manager who is also a, a listener the, I think the problem is that we don't assign a manager as a listener. I think we're just telling them to go engage and we need to tell them to also listen. In fact, I would I would do it in the opposite way and say your job is to listen and then we want you to engage. Because if we did that more often, we'd probably understand our the value of what our clients are starting to say or what the market's starting to say more. And I think listening is a skill that most people as humans don't have um, you know as uh, produced very well and so if we could do that as companies man that would go miles as 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 i mentioned before with hertz they were listening and they got it uh it 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 reminds me of a discussion you and i have had and i think all of us have had at one point or another about the 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 benefit of the emotional intelligence or something you know related to that and having somebody on the ball who understands how to how to listen because a part of emotional intelligence is is a component of it is listening but also uh, to, to have an understanding of how to look at that one individual and understand their needs and understand how to react to their needs um, on on uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis for that particular situation um, would, would you agree with that at all on a one-on-one -on -one basis yeah absolutely so um, and that's where it starts to get into influencers like who who is influencing um, and who has a voice and who's speaking out and where do you want to take your conversation so how does all that start to work I think into a one-to-one -one conversation with the with the people that are that are um, going to both influence or you know it starts to get into that whole social selling part which I think is the other part of this discussion where you're trying to get um, a one-to-one -one relationship that's what this this social medium is all about it's not about the media part it's about the social part and so when we're um, getting in there and we're having discussions with people it really needs to be one-to-one -one. Um, and so when you have that conversation with somebody you know most people on social I see getting on are trying to sell right away and as we all know that doesn't work um, but when you get in there and you really start to dialogue and understand someone and listen to them and follow them over time and really start to pay pay attention to what they're doing I think that's it it's um, uh, it really starts to show the energy behind your interest in in what they're doing and and there's a there's a pull there I think Adam you and I or Janet and Steve I think we've all kind of like been in each other's social circles for quite some time now and I'd call that kind of social listening if you will because we've been kind of listening to each other over time and and now here we are on meeting each well, other except so. Steve we all listen to Steve <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, 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 there's it, one in every group, right? <laughs> and Brian, it, it reminds me. Um, I, mean, I think you said this even when we were when we met in in Vegas at the conference, and and I'm and I'm in agreement. Is I'd rather focus on you know a limited number of individuals and really having um, and actually maybe Dave Delaney to be honest because he was doing a networking thing, but uh, he was talking about I'd rather have a stronger connection uh, with a few folks than an extremely weak connection with 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 many and um, I think oftentimes people don't look at that trade-off and they say you know I'd rather have thousand loose ties and that loose tie being so thin it's like somebody's following me or something and that's about it rather than taking the time to try to strengthen those ties with a with a you know a smaller group of individuals um, and, and and really the the power that comes from that um, we are out of time for this segment but uh, Brian we want you to stick around here and then we want to also share with folks where um, in fact let's do it right now where can folks find out more about you online yeah you know the best way to find out more about me is on my website briankramer.com b-r-y-a-n-k-r-a-m-e-r.com and um, and then I'm on Twitter Brian Kramer Facebook Brian Kramer Google Brian Kramer. Brian Kramer. I see a pattern emerging <laughs> here. <laughs> That's great. 
Well, cool. And, uh, yeah, I definitely think Brian's one of the, the, the few folks that I know that I think um, practices what he preaches, both personally and professionally. Um, we wanted him on the show for some time in the past. Um, timing didn't didn't work out. And then, again, I had an opportunity to meet with him face-to-face -face, um, over in Vegas and get to know him, and I'm thankful for that. So um, you stick around here, Brian. We're going to talk about a few other things that we've got going on around the web, and we'd love to hear what you think about that too. Y'all, you game? Yeah, I'm in. Awesome, awesome. So, Steve, what's your share this week, sir? Well, you know, one of the things we've talked about before and, and I've said is, I, you know, I, we keep looking at, like, Facebook, and I think that social platforms continue to uh, um, fracture because they're just, you know, you just they don't meet everybody's needs. And, and there's a group called uh, iStrategy Labs, which did a, uh, a demographic, Facebook demographic uh, report about in 2011, and they just did another one. Uh, just now, so in that three years, there's some interesting growth numbers. So between January 2011 and January 2014, uh, they saw um, the 13 to 17 year olds drop as growth, uh, you know, by 25 percent, which is which is pretty which is pretty huge. Now, you know, the other thing is, but you know, inversely, and I think this is. Uh, very telling. You know, the 55 plus range grew 80 percent, and 35 to 54, 40 percent, and, and uh, 18 to 24, 20, you know, 32 percent. So I, what I think this really shows is, is not. It doesn't really matter that kids are leaving per se. It just shows that it doesn't meet everybody's needs, and that's why you see the, this uh, uh, growth of Snapchat or even things like Tinder and other groups, because you're going to see things that are more, I think, niche. And this, I just this kind of points to Facebook is nice. It's not going to go away anytime soon. But at some point, they get so big, it doesn't meet everybody's needs. It can't be all things to everybody. And we see that with AOL. You know, eventually they're really huge and they go away. And you see that with you know Microsoft and, and so forth. So, and I think that we're seeing that uh, Facebook starting to, to, to splinter, and they're not going to be able to keep up with acquisitions. Though so they'll use their money for a while to, to you know, like with the, the acquisitions they've made. To, to try to fight that trend, but anyway, we'll share those numbers. It's worth taking, you know, digging into a little bit. But you just see that you know older populations are really adopting quickly, younger populations moving to other things, and I think that uh, that's just the way of the future. I have a quick response to that. Go ahead. My quick response is, is interestingly enough, younger people become older people, but young older people don't become younger people. So in the end, it, it's great that in that in that in that in that period in time, they have that. that that's what their needs are. But when people talk about, you know, young people aren't using Facebook, it's great. That's what they, they're young people at this moment. But eventually, what do they become? They become a potential audience. They become that growing audience for Facebook. What was that, Janet? Sorry for cutting you off. No, no, I cut you off. I do it all the time. Look, it's okay. It, to me, it's interesting, though, because what those demographics are telling us is that marketers are going to have to use Facebook differently. You know, maybe it isn't going to be the place where they're going to be marketing Red Bull quite so much because it really <laughs> isn't going to be their market, right? So it, it's it's really important to to pay attention to those demographics. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead, Brian. One, one of the things I was going to say is there's also a big trend right now with um, kids that are, you know, Facebook is tracking a lot of the people that are coming off of uh, Facebook by um, uh, quitting their accounts or closing their accounts. But what they can't tell is when they reopen a new account, um, and so you know because they're in these circles of you know people they don't like, bullies, whatever, they're closing the account and then they're reopening it and just taking on the friends they want to be friends with, and it's a whole new trend that's kind of starting to happen and submerge um, behind the scenes, and it's happening kind of you know in the millions um, level. So you know while they're while the, the Decline's pretty big. It's just a trend that I'm kind of paying attention to, you know, on the side as well. That's interesting. They're getting rid of their parents following them. Is what they're well, doing. yeah. I don't. I mean, I think what, you know, when you look at the the change numbers, that they would in this report that would wash. You know, that one uh, de deactivated and one activated would wash those numbers out. So what we're really seeing is 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 a specifically a decline. And I don't think again, I don't think they're really about the youth. It's it's interesting, but I think what's really telling is you just see. People's needs aren't met by everything, you know. Yeah. And again, you have all these new other social platforms that are, you know, social, local, you know, mobile kinds of stuff. And it, and so I, it just shows that there are going to be continue to be op you know, new opportunities coming. 
and as people adopt new behaviors. I, I wish that I had the post at the ready. I read something, I think it was yesterday or the day before, where they were sharing that, that this year, 2014, is a year where Facebook is actually going to push a lot more by creating a series of of, of niche applications for different needs that it believes that it, what it needs to do now is more along the lines of what it did when it created its messenger app and that that's why it acquired Instagram and that it believes that it can do that more in, in a number of different areas because people are doing exactly what you just said Steve. Oh, we got some dead air. <laughs> Uh, I, anything to say. I can't tell if we're frozen in time on the, on the lag or if, if it, but uh, so so Janet, you have something to share as well, right? I do, in fact, and it also happens to be Facebook focused. Um, you know, I I think it's really interesting how Facebook is trying to get our attention right after they stopped basically showing anything that we actually opted in to see. So now they're all of a sudden starting to promote a new product called Trending. And I found this on, uh, Mike Alton wrote a post about it. But basically they're starting to show trending topics um, kind of as a way to resurface things. Yeah. And it's going to be very interesting to see if they show those trending topics and then make them the ones that they resurfaced from something you wrote two years ago and no longer care about because that's something they started doing about what? two months ago. So it, it's um, Facebook is trying to actually be proactive and bring stuff to our attention. It's just not the stuff that we said we wanted. I'd, a I'd actually add to that that um, Facebook's trying to compete with Twitter um, because Twitter is a news stream and Facebook is not. I don't think of Facebook as, a, as, as much a news stream as Twitter. I think it's a, 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 a large part um, hurting because it, it can't spread news the way that Twitter can. And I think trends has a lot to do with how they're going to start trying to compete in um, bringing news into the fold. Well, maybe I, Facebook should just buy BuzzFeed and get it over with. Yeah, you know, right. I, I, actually, I actually think the problem is, is, there's another problem which I've noticed that's interesting, is, is that I've started, to, you know, about a year ago, I started accepting people I didn't know as well on, on, on Facebook. So I got tired of just saying no to everybody. I felt like it was a jerk. Oh. And, and so, but what happened is, like, there are a number of people, because of the way the algorithm works, what it has it has a weakness, which is if you share a lot of content and you learn how to share good content, you can literally push almost everybody out from the news feed. And so I have, you know, three or four or five people always at the top of my feed because they produce massive amounts of quantity. So this is this is a problem. There are people I want I mean there are people who I, I love a lot who who I'm just not seeing and I don't have a way to uh to, you know, to really see that. So anyway, I just I think that that's a problem. Actually, one real quick tool tip is a thing called FB Purity, and it actually helps. Uh, uh, I actually did a I posted it on Facebook, and face, Facebook did not show it at all, which is interesting. Um, and so, but well, but that FB Purity allows you actually to adjust some of the things that uh, you see in Facebook, take out some of the uh, the ads and some pop ups and that kind of stuff. So, uh, well, um, interesting. So I got a quick one here to share. And by the way, all the things that we're talking about we'll have in the in the show notes. So if you want to get to the links instead of Googling for things and all that, you know, go over to the FridayHangout.com, check out the post with Brian Kramer on it. You'll be able to get those links as well. Um, I'll just share. So I found that I'm, I'm really intrigued by taking a look at Twitter and how they are evolving as an ad network, as, as, a, as a way to advertise to folks, and how they're sort of trying to find ways to um, target better, create more relevancy, use different types of content cards for uh, capturing and attracting folks. And so this week they uh, launched, it's on their blog, for their, their advertising blog, um, new ways to create and use tailored audiences. And so... Um, you know, part of advertising, part of part of keeping costs down with advertising is, is, of course, choosing the right audience, and part of not pissing off or overexposing yourself to folks that shouldn't be seeing your advertising is also, uh, you know, finding the right audience and targeting the right people. And so, what they've done is they've allowed, uh, they they've um, implemented or they're rolling out three new features to their advertising platform for targeting. One is that you can actually take a select list of email addresses, say from your CRM um, or from an advertising database that you have or, or something like that. So imagine that you have 
uh, 10,000 people who are card members for your brand, their, uh, you know, uh, their their brands. They, they use a fashion brand as an example, uh, who have signed up for you know discounts and that sort of thing. And you know that they are folks that are interested in your brand and you want to market to them on Twitter. Well, you use that that finite list as the list to market towards, and you you can tailor your ads towards them. And you know that it's going out to folks who have already had a touch uh, with you. Um, you can also use explicit Twitter IDs, so that's the second way. You can actually take and get a list of Twitter IDs, which means, of course, having to, to harvest those and find them and identify them and add them to a list. So say you wanted to reach out to your specific influencers, that's uh, another great way that you would do that. And then the last thing they've added to that is an exclusion targeting, which allows you to specifically exclude individuals from your, your list as well, so that way you can be very finite and definite with who you exclude. So I find it pretty interesting to see how they're evolving uh, and, and adding little uh, bit by bit tools to their advertising arsenal. I've had a lot of luck with the actual targeting user IDs and followers of users with Twitter ads, but I wish that they would let us focus a little bit more, especially geographically in those, those types of things. I still think Facebook ads have a long way to go. Getting better Facebook ads or Twitter ads? I'm sorry, I meant to say Twitter ads. Yeah, I, I agree. It may be nice to be able to see, you know, if they had some ability to, like, you know, so you could use them, do, you know, prom I would use promoted tweets at certain kinds of events a lot more than I would ever do on Facebook. Yeah, who uses Facebook events anymore? I don't know. Brian, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Dead air. Brian, go. <laughs> um... <laughs> Say something clever and then go. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, just the whole, I mean, just kind of taking it up a little bit to the whole advertising uh, kind of in-network um, ads, the the ads that, that we're, we're all paying to play. It's, it's kind of interesting, and I think everybody's a little pissed off that they have to pay to get their, their stuff seen. And um, so I think that's really kind of where... Um, you know, with the algorithm change, with the uh, pay-to-play change, with a lot of these things happening, it's no, you know, it's, you, when you look at why MySpace took a dive, it's because they didn't do what Facebook is doing right now. It's because they didn't do what Twitter's doing right now. And, um, and we're all, as consumers, are going to have to start setting aside budgets if we hadn't before to pay to get our content seen. And I think, you know, if... If, if we're used to just selling our events and putting our events out on ads, that's probably um, going to change, and it's going to start to become more promoted content, and we're going to get used to build, getting our content out there. Not that, that we can't start keep doing it for free, but I think content's going to be, a uh, portion of it is going to be a pay-to-play, and we're just going to get used to that as a, as a social society. It is supposed to be a business after all. Yeah, who would have thought that 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 big uh, that big building out there off the Dumbarton Bridge actually had bills to pay, right? Where the Facebook headquarters is. Um, Do you know that that facility used to be called? It used to be the uh, it used to be a Sun facility. They called it yeah, Sun yeah. Quentin. <laughs> what did you say about San Quentin? It used to call it, when it used to be a Sun building because it's so remote and kind of windy and it's kind of out in this wetlands area. And they used to call it Sun Quentin. Sun Quentin. Yeah. Now it's, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a pithy way, but nothing sounds like it'll roll off the tongue. Zuckerberg, Quentin, no, it doesn't work, doesn't work. Quentin Tino? Um, <laughs> Qu Quentin Bird. <laughs> oh, well, boy. we wanted to uh, thank you guys, all the all the listeners uh, who've been watching on the, on the live stream uh, and have been putting up with a little bit of lag that we've been having, and of course that'll carry on to the recording, so thanks for being patient we love uh, your with faces. that as well. Uh, it's all, all the... We love your face. So a lot of bandwidth stuff going on. And again, um, we want to thank Brian Kramer for making the time. I mean, it really was only a couple days ago that I reached out to you. So thank you for making the time to join us so quickly. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And, and uh, good stuff you guys are doing here. I'm having, it was a lot of fun. And stick around after we we, uh, we, we close out the show here. But uh, visit him at briankramer.com, B-R-Y-A-N-K-R-A-M-E-R. -E Go ahead and find him uh, all over the place online. As he said, he's Brian Kramer everywhere. Steve, where can they find you? Steveology on Twitter and the Steveology blog on WordPress. Love you. 
And uh, you, is that me personally, Steve? Me? Yeah, actually, I, I do love you, brother. Uh oh, all right. Well, I thought we were trying to keep that, you know, On offline, the but um, <laughs> Janet. I love Janet, you. Do you want us to you turn our video cameras off? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Janet, how about you? Do, you? do you love me too, Janet? I mean, uh, uh, where can they find you? Of course I love you. <laughs> You're one where of my can they find, Where can they find you, what, what Janet? Me, Everybody Janet? can find me at jfouts almost everywhere. Uh, and you can find my blog at JanetFouts.com. And uh, I'm Adam. I'm Secret Sushi. Anywhere you find me, you can find Adam Hellway uh, as well as Secret Sushi. And uh, again, you can find the show. We really, really appreciate it. We'd love to hear what you think of the show. Go ahead and tweet us with the hashtag Friday Hangout on Twitter. Uh, and that's where you know you usually tweet and stuff. And um, and then, of course, uh, you can find us on iTunes for the audio recording, YouTube for the video recording, Spreaker.com, and then also on iHeartRadio where you can listen to all the episodes as well. So um, thank you guys for joining us again next week. Janet, do we want to tell people who's going to be here? Are we going to cross our fingers gonna that they're going to stick with us? We're going to have Devon Rosen, the LinkedIn expert. She's super fabulous, and she's going to talk about brands on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, that's cool because there's so much stuff going on with LinkedIn over the last year and a half that it'll be an interesting conversation. So, again, I, I want to ask her if I should open a profile on LinkedIn. She's probably going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us on the Friday Hangout. We'll see you again around 11 ish next Friday, Pacific time. Take care. Have a great weekend. See you next week, everybody.